OK, good. So everything I'm talking about is in this book, Ask, Thank, Tell. Do you have a copy, or have you read it? Yes. All right. If not, there's a stack up here, along with a free Cuisinart brochure. <laughs> That's how we're oh, okay. That's ministry. That's ministry. <laughs> All right. We'll just put a couple at each table okay. and let you fight over them. Um, I'm going to keep one copy to refer to. <clears throat> so, those of you that are watching on videotape, this is recorded live at St. Mark's Lutheran Church. Is it St. Mark's? With an a St. Mark, no apostrophe S, in Woonsocket. Rhode Island, where they where they they park side by side, or side by each, side by each. Whoa, you guys are in your own universe up here. So everything's in this booklet. So if you want to open up, I go really fast through this. So if you were hoping for a nice snooze event where you can catch some extra, that's not going to happen. All right, so we're going to start. I'm on page number one, two, three. There's a covenant that your pastor and your church council uh, president and treasurer sign, which basically a covenant about what we're doing here tonight. The top half says all the things you agree to do, and the bottom half says the things that I agree to do. And the top half basically says you understand that this is not an four-step easy approach, that it will require energy, time, and financial commitment to ensure its success. I like people to know that there is no such thing as four easy steps. And most of you in this room look like you've had enough life experience to know that there's no four easy steps to anything. You know, you can go in the Barnes and Noble and you can see books, four easy steps to raising a difficult teenager. And the book is full of lies because it, it doesn't work. Um, and you agree to have people here basically fill out stuff and agree your, uh, increase your mission support. Your mission support is the financial mission support you partner with us in the New England Synod and with others all across the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and around the world. And I want to thank you for your mission support, which I think is, as I saw, is $5,000 a year. That's very generous for a congregation this size and with your income, and I really appreciate that. That makes a lot of great things happen. It's also an expression to the rest of your congregation that you believe in generosity that you believe in, uh, in giving and supporting ministries that, that happen. So thank you very much. The bottom half basically says I'm going to show up, it's going to be good, and you're going to like me. All right, so we've done that. Now we're on to page four. What are we trying to accomplish? We need more money so we can pay the bills. We need to find quick and easy ways to shake down our people so they will cough up the cash. We are a not-for-profit organization that has fiscal responsibilities according to our Constitution. And in order to meet those responsibilities, we need to present a balanced budget to the corporation's governing body this winter. We are seeking ways to get everyone else in the church to increase their giving so that we on the church council don't have to extend ourselves. We want to do some excellent ministry in our community and around the world, so we need more money in our budget. We like our pastor, and we don't pay our pastor enough money, even if she did move into the parsonage. So we were hoping you'd come here and show us some easy schmeasy ways to increase giving. We want to help our people grow in their relationship with Christ through their financial stewardship. I would suggest to you that while the first one, two, three, four, five, six things that I read may have some truth in them, or they may be completely true, or some of them have a little tongue in cheek in them, I would suggest that if we do number seven, if we do the last one, it will take care of everything else above. That our mission, that what we're talking about when we talk about financial stewardship in our congregations is helping our people to grow in their relationship with Christ through their financial stewardship. We put that first and foremost. We work on that again and again and again. We are pretty close to Foxborough, Massachusetts, home of the New England Patriots. Some of you may be Patriot fans. Oh, good. Whew. 
I do this presentation in some places and I get booed by the giant fans. If I'm farther down in Connecticut. Um, but one of the things that is a hallmark of the Patriots, whether you like them or not, is they keep the main thing the main thing. And in the church, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is to help our people grow in their relationship with Christ through their generosity. We're going to talk about how to do that. Okay, let's do a little quiz. Who said each of the following statements? If you've got a pen, just write down what you think is the answer, and uh, we'll, we'll look at that. So the first one is, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So just write down who you think said that. All right, anybody have any guesses? Any volunteers? Yes. No. Jesus. Jesus. Right. It might be in Mark's, it might be in the Gospel of Mark, or, or I can't remember, or I wonder if it's Matthew, but it, whatever, you got the idea, Jesus. All right, good. Um, next one. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly. Who said that or wrote that? Paul, very good. Usually if you have long sentences that, <laughs> with lots of commas, it's probably either Paul or it's a German relative and it was translated into English. All right, next one. God helps those who help themselves. This is a little bit of a trick one. Any guesses? Benjamin Franklin. Every once in a while, somebody thinks that's in the Bible. It's not. It's part of Benjamin Franklin's little sayings booklet that he had. For God loves a cheerful giver. It's in the Bible. It is in the Bible. Right. Good. It's actually St. Paul. It's one of the few brief things that he said. Um, so that's St. Paul. Next one, or the last one, I'm a better person, a better human being when I'm generous. Yes! Have you seen this presentation before? Very good. Yes, that's my quote. And I have found it's true. When I am a generous person, when I have a generous spirit, when I have a generous attitude, when I'm generous in my financial giving, when I'm generous with my time, when I'm generous with my ears, I find that people are attracted to me. But when I'm stingy, and I'm all kind of, you know, wound up a little tight, and I don't want to give away my time, and I want to focus just on me, myself, and I, I find that people aren't. So when we're generous people, I believe we're better human beings. And by extension, I think we are also then disciples. I think generosity is one of the key ways we learn how to be a disciple of Jesus. Okay, next page, some facts about your church. So this is custom, and this is going to be broadcast all over the internet, so everybody on the planet is going to know this information. So you can write these things down. This is your church, your pastor, um, and your council president. But the first question is, how many people are members of your church? So you have 277 baptized members that are on the rolls. You might, some of those folks you see regularly, some of them you do not see very often, or you're saying ever in some case. Okay. What is your average Sunday worship attendance? 44. Okay, yeah, that sounds closer to, to accurate. All right, so we'll just write 44 there. What was your Christmas attendance last year? 68. So 68 for Christmas. What was your Easter Sunday attendance last year? 101. So that's interesting because usually I see it the other way around. I see Christmas more well attended than Easter. So that's unusual. I don't know why that is. Year we did one service at nine o'clock. It's the second year we did one service at nine o'clock. But it may. So it was the year before we went to bed. I remember thinking that. 
the time. Did we have a baptism that day? No. I think we did. No. Next question. What is your total current year expenditure? How much money do you spend a year? 127,000. So if you want the exact figure, it's 127,254 and 44 cents. <laughs> I want to know what the 44 cents was spent on because that's not even a postage stamp anymore. Okay. Um, I'll move over. Okay, next thing. What are, is your total offerings from members? 93,945. So that's your offerings. And I want to commend you. That is an outstanding figure in comparison to your average Sunday worship attendance. That's more than double. Typically, I see 44 average worship attendants, I would not be surprised to see 44,000 to maybe 66,000. That's kind of a range that I've seen as I've done this. You're the 23rd or 24th church I've done this with. So the fact that you're at 93,000 is really to be commended. That's wonderful. How many households do you have? 66. So then typically we also can kind of think of about on average, if we see 66 households, we can think of a range, give or take 10,000 of 66,000. So even using that as a barometer, 66,000, take it up to 76,000, still you're at 93,000, that's wonderful. So you're generous people. I should have you do the workshop for the other <laughs> congregations in the Synod. All right, how many pledging households you have is 41. So what I want, and then the next one, then we'll talk about these figures for a little bit more in detail. How many households give but don't pledge because it's against their religion? <laughs> seven. So you have seven households who give but don't pledge, and you have 41 who pledge and give. So add those two up is 48, but you have 66 households in the congregation. So that's how many households are not at all? 18. 18. So one goal to think about is if you're at 48 households now, you have 66, could you grow that from say 48 households to 52 households or 54 households? You're not gonna get all the 100% in one year, this is gonna take time, but could you just think about, could we grow four or six households to either of those categories of giving but not pledging um, or, or pledging? Another question I want to go back to on the dollar figures is, so you spend 127 and you take in 93, so the difference there is roughly what, 35? 34,000? So how are you making that up? Magic. Magic. <laughs> Magic. Well, then we've got to talk afterwards. <laughs> Anybody else have any ideas besides magic? Fundraisers. So you do some fundraisers? Yeah. Extra giving campaigns. Okay, some like extra give, give towards this particular thing, all right? Okay, all right. We had some generous members. Okay, so some extra mile giving. So it's, but it's not coming from an endowment. Okay. Well, the reason I ask is because as I go around and I do these workshops, one of the things when I ask that question of congregations, I'll tell you one church, uh, it's 50000 a year. I said, well, where does the 50000 a year come from? They said, well, it comes from our endowment. I said, oh, how much is in the endowment? And they said, well, 10 years ago it had 500000 And I said, oh, well, how much do you have? And they said, well, that's why you're here. <laughs> In other words, they were at the end of their rope, so I was come in to do the magic. And, you know, that's pretty tough to turn that around. So you're not pulling that from any kind of savings. Yeah. yeah. We also did some, some cutbacks on things that we had contracted out that we started doing ourselves, like the lawn care and um, cut back on the church cleaning. 
Um, we had our um, uh, insurance policy. We went, went out to bid and got some better quotes on our insurance policy. Um, putting me in the parsonage, um, cut back on not only some dollars that went out, but also um, some, again, that was insurance cut because we were paying abandoned building status. Mm. So we, um, All right, so some various cost cutting on the expense side, you reduced your expenses. Okay. All right, good. So you're trying to figure it out. I'm going to tell you right now, you're not alone. We've got 180 congregations that are trying to figure this out. And I think that 179 and 7 eighths are in the same boat. In other words, everybody. Everybody's trying to figure this out. Everybody's up against it. They're trying to figure out how to do the income and the expenses, how to operate our churches efficiently. So don't feel like, oh, we're the only ones. Because I've done 23 or 24 of them. The numbers vary, but the pattern is the same. The pattern is the same. The expenditures are up here. The income's here. And how do we do that? So that's what we're going to talk about, some ways to do stewardship to try to address that in a practical way. All right. Uh, what percentage of those pledgers fulfilled or exceeded their pledge? So that's of the 41. How many of them fulfilled it or gave more? 75%, which is actually pretty good. Um, but it also means that 25% of those people were less. They gave, maybe they committed to up here, but they gave less. So we'll talk about some ideas that might help that. And that might be another goal. Maybe, maybe in a year you could move that from 75% to say 80% or 85% to get it to increase it. Does your pastor have access to the giving patterns of your members? No. I would encourage you to look carefully and strongly at redoing that and changing that. And here's why. First of all, Charles Lane talks about that in his book, why it's important. Here's a couple of practical reasons why I think it's important for the pastor to be aware of the giving. Number one is practical. I don't know of any other organization, business, nonprofit, anything on in the country where the main employee, the executive director, does not know the income stream sources for the operation. So just from a pure business operational point of view, I think the pastor needs to know. Second, oftentimes it is in giving that pastoral care needs show up. So for instance, when I was in the parish, I had a very good relationship with the financial secretary. And uh, she, uh, for a while, and then later was he, would say to me, you know, just want you to know that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez, um, I haven't, their, their givings like all of a sudden dropped off in the last three months. I would take that information and what would I do? First of all, I would call up and I would not say, hey, the financial secretary says you're behind. <laughs> Come on, I mean, I didn't do that. I would call up and I would just say, hi, uh, Josephine, uh, this is Pastor Hazelwood. Um, how you doing? I just thought I'd call and check in with you. And I cannot tell you the number of times the following conversation happened. Oh, you know, I have been meaning to call you. And I would then learn about somebody in the family lost a job, somebody that had a health crisis, there was a marital conflict going on. And it was an opportunity for me to provide pastoral ministry to that family. Did I ever then go, I didn't, I didn't go even go into the giving piece. It was just ministry opportunities. And oftentimes it shows up in the offering envelope, uh, giving, but where people, you know, it's not going to show up in other ways. Because we all have problems, we've all got things that are going on in our lives, and we all come to church, and let's be honest, we all try to put the best face forward. And so there's a giving, there's an opportunity. And the third thing, those, those are the two strongest ones, the third thing is, I think it's important that the pastor have an opportunity to engage in conversations with people about the connection between generosity and spirituality. 
Now, every pastor that I know that has access to the giving records has, does this in a responsible way. I do not know of any pastor that's, you know, on Sundays going through and looking and then measuring or anything like that. Um, but I would, ask you, I would ask you to consider looking at that and exploring that and having a conversation about that, about how that would go. So would you at least agree with me that that's worth having a conversation about going forward? I'm seeing some heads going up and down and then some heads are not moving, but no heads are going like this. So <laughs> it, at least you're saying we're willing to have a conversation about that. Okay, good. And you can read more about what Charles Lane says about that in his book. Okay, next page. <clears throat> Ask, thank, tell. We want to help our people grow in their relationship with Christ through their stewardship. I'm on page six. Cultivating a culture of generosity and thanksgiving in a congregation is not rocket science. It involves three things. Ask, thank, tell. I love the book because it says what it is and it is what it says. It's just clear and you can frame everything you do around stewardship around these three words. In fact, some congregations have changed the name of their stewardship committee to the Ask, Thank, Tell team. Other congregations have said, that's too much. We've got two people doing ask, two doing thank, and two doing tell. So just a, a way to think about it. All right, ask at the bottom of page six. If you want people to give, you have to ask them. They will not do it automatically. How many of you go to Stop and Shop or Shaw's and you go through the line and they say to you when you check out, would you like to give a dollar to the Jimmy Fund or whatever it may be, right? We hear that. Why do you think they do that? Because it, it works. Because I, every time I'm there and the per, between the person here, myself and the person there, one of the three of us says yes. I mean, just, just from like listening. Um, now, I don't know if, I'm sure their percentages aren't that high, but, but the point is, if, do you think if they just had a sign there? No, they ask. So we have to ask. Now, in our Lutheran congregations, we have a tendency with kind of our Northern European piety, typically, has been our historical patterns. I know the church is changing and becoming more diverse, but our pattern has been like, well, we don't want to make a big deal of this, you know, we don't want to make people feel guilty. So we don't ask. Now there is a way that we do ask every Sunday. What is that way? Offering. Get, the, offering. the offering plate goes by. That's a form of an ask. We're going to talk more about ways to ask that are helpful. Two, thank. If you want people to give, you must thank them. They will stop giving if you stop thanking them. How many of you have ever given to somebody? Maybe it's a grandchild.